I'm here uh, to talk to you about a kind of a difficult top, uh, difficult subject. Uh, when I when I submitted this talk, I was like, yeah, let's do something different for a change. I mean, I'm on stage uh, frequently enough, but I actually talk about like technical subjects, uh, React most of the time, uh, React async and promises and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, let's talk about all the failures that I had, like. Well, uh, so this is my end of my talk. I never feel. No. Just kidding. Uh, so um, Bob Ross uh, is famous for saying, like, uh, we don't make mistakes. We make happy accidents. So let's cheer it up a bit. So uh, this is me. Uh, I'm Gert. I work for a company called Chroma. Uh, so uh, like Robert said, uh, Chroma is the company behind Storybook. Uh, so actually, I'm not the one to work on Storybook full time. I work on uh, 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 products related to Storybook, which use Storybook, but Norbert is uh, also here in the audience who, who actually works on it full time. Uh, so yeah, uh, but I uh, also have uh, a side project. It's my own open source project. I started uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, it actually originated from an app that I built uh, in house for Xebia, uh, my former employee uh, employer. Um, so React Async is a library that uh, helps you to build asynchronous UI components and async do e basically everything with promises in React and handle that in a really nice way that is idiomatic in the React uh, ecosystem. Um, and uh, I open sourced this uh, in the summer of 2018, so a little over a year ago. Uh, and yeah, uh, been working on that like for quite a, uh, quite some time uh, ever since, used it in a couple projects that I was doing for, for customers, um, and it, it's it's going pretty well. So, um, like I said, uh, React Async, a little bit about it. This is not a talk about uh, technical uh, things about React Async, uh, but it's built around promises. It, it it handles things like all the states that uh, promises can be in, so pending, fulfilled, and rejected states, uh, to to so that you can, for example, implement your loading indicator in a in a loading states and such in in the proper ways. Uh, and it then it deals with like all the intricacies of the of the uh, the asynchronous lifecycle where it can fail, for example, or if you trigger multiple promises in a quick succession. So you have a button, and every time you click it, an HTTP request fires off. Uh, well, you will want probably to cancel the previous ones and abort the underlying HTTP request uh, to avoid race conditions. Uh, so that's one of the things that React Async handles for you out of the box. Um, and then you can uh, have it, for example, start uh, doing an HTTP request when a component renders. Uh, so when, when you mount a component, we'll fetch some data so that it can render, for example, or uh, handle uh, like user interactions, like uh, submitting a form, for example. So uh, this has been going for a little of a year, and uh, it's actually doing pretty well. Uh, it's not big enough yet to my liking, but uh, I, so I hope you will all start using it tomorrow um, or next week. Um, uh, but but let's first talk about a little bit about the journey that I that I experienced over the past year. So I made a bunch of mistakes, and you'll probably all be kind of familiar with these things that that they just happen. Everyone fucks up every now and then. Um, so I do too. And one of those things that, for example, I did on uh, more than one occasion is breaking a build. And that means not breaking my build, no, breaking someone else's build, because I published a version in a patch release, and people tend to depend on like a, 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 a range of, ver of versions so, uh, um, in, in Semver. Um, where they they're like you have this, this tilde sign in your package of json and that essentially means like i only care about major and minor but patch can be anything so if i release a patch version and it's got a breaking change in there um and they depend on it and it goes into their ci their ci system is going to break uh, so th yeah this happens uh, i try to prevent that from happening obviously i don't want that to happen because i want the uh, the uh, the library to be reliable and people should be able to rely on that it works properly every always uh, but yeah uh, sometimes you still basically fuck up but that's also because it can be fairly tricky because a bug fix which usually in in Semver, like a bug fix is a patch release when i fix a bug and it's just a bug that i fixed i'll release a patch release if i have a new feature i'll do a minor release and if it's a breaking change if it's a breaking change, always it's a major release. I just actually just thought of that recently. It's like 
we should not be celebrating major releases. We should only be celebrating minor releases because minor releases, they bring new features. But major releases, that's always like a pain in the ass because people are going to have to migrate their stuff and upgrade, uh, do, because it's a breaking change. They have to upgrade, uh, probably some, do some API uh, th stuff. I actually uh, sometimes ship uh, code mods uh, to automat automate that change, but still, uh, it's a pain. But also a bug fix may actually be oftentimes a breaking change. And that's, that's one of the things that I've, I've tripped over, uh, is that it, something might seem like a simple bug fix, but there are so many side things that you have to consider, like the entire ecosystem within which your package lives, uh, that it may t might still break in a certain scenario. I mean, people might rely on the fact that it was broken in the past, which, uh, uh, which obviously shouldn't they shouldn't do that, but it still happens. Or I make a minor change in the API and it's, it's not breaking in JavaScript world, but it also means a change in the type definition in TypeScript. And people are relying on TypeScript, are using TypeScript. Then it will also break because it, it won't compile anymore, for example. Uh, so th that's one of those things that, that happens. So, okay, what can you do if you, uh, if you publish a broken release? Well, you can try to unpublish it, on npm, you can just do npm unpublish uh, this package, this specific version. I want to unpublish it, uh, but um, it's generally frowned upon. Actually, the npm uh, organization they say like you should only do this really if you, uh, if you for example published secret uh, information like credentials to I don't know your CI system. So which is actually something I did. So there's actually like my. The, the token that I use to deploy stuff on now, sites now, it's actually somewhere in GitHub. Uh, but yeah, the token is obviously revoked now, but uh, yeah, I, I did that too. Um, I, 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 I accidentally published those credentials, so anyone could have uploaded websites on my account. But anyway, um, and that, that's fairly minor. But th so the better way to do it is to deprecate it, right? So there's actually a couple of things. This is actually a true one. 0, 7.0.0 .0 .0 is actually deprecated uh, because I was like, yay, we have a major release now, and oh, fuck, it's broken. Um, uh, because it was actually uh, around the time I was releasing version 7, uh, we, we, we actually migrated from like just doing uh, uh, Babel, uh, like Babel uh, transpile and make package and deploy that on. Uh, like publish that on npm, we mo we moved to a uh, thing called pack, uh, and pack is a different way to package up your 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 code basically, so that it will actually not ship uh, only ES5 code, but also the original source code and ES modules code because modern browsers support that, and uh, you probably are using like consuming this inside Webpack. And in that case, your web, the, your own Webpack uh, can decide whether or not to transpile this library, uh, uh, so it can be optimized, actually. So that, that's great. But anyway, and one thing I, I learned that, and I started doing that, but that's still not enough, is like working with release candidates. Uh, so es essentially, release candidate is like, OK, I have done all this work, and I want to go and release this now. Uh, but let's take a step back and do an alpha release. It's probably basically already done, or beta beta release, or RC release, whatever you want to call it, um, and release that, and then start using that particular version in various projects. Um, ask people to please, uh, I fix this bug for you in this particular release. Can you can you test it, uh, please, in your application? So I, I started doing that, and sure, it takes a couple extra weeks before I can actually do the, the, the actual release of the, of the real thing, but it saves me from having to circle back later on to fix the mistake that I might have made. So that's actually a pretty good strategy that I started to adopt. So mistake number, number two is forgetting about the integrations. So React Async is it's just one library, and React Async is just a cog in the wheel, right? It's a part of a bigger whole. It, you will use it in, in your React application, but that might be a create React application. Someone's own custom built Webpack config might be there. They might be using Next.js or Gatsby or uh, React Native 
uh, I've, I've, I've been, I've been, uh, I've seen used like and TypeScript, and they might want to use it with Redux or MobX or React Router or Downshift or React Table was one of those things that came up in the issue tracker. Um, like you have to take care that it does that, that your library doesn't break in the bigger picture, right? So, so that's what one of the things that I started to do. Uh, another thing is. Um, is testing against React itself. Because I've been bitten before by React, the React team shipping a new version, and that might be a patch or a minor version, um, and it breaking React Async. Uh, because they too deprecate stuff, they change stuff. Um, so what I'm actually doing in React Async is in CI, I run this thing called test compat, and that will actually test against version 16.3, which is the first version that we support, of React and React DOM, and then run the same set suite, suite of tests, or actually a well, slightly uh, different suite, but um, against the upcoming, so the next version of React. So that will probably be, I don't know, 16.10? Is that released already? I don't know. Um, and then finally against the latest version of React, like the current. Uh, stable version of it. And, and that way I can, I can test for both backwards compatibility and forwards compatibility with React at least. So that's one of the things that I do. Uh, and then on the other subject of all the other libraries in the ecosystem, I want to have examples for each of them. That's what, so, uh, so in the repo for React Async, there's also a bunch of examples. These are not the whole list. Uh, this is just a subset of it. Um, but I want to have examples for Next.js, for React Native, for React Router, for Suspense with TypeScript, all of those things. And then in CI, run all the tests for all of the examples against the uh, version of React Async, which I'm about to release. So that's actually what, uh, what I ir originally wasn't doing. And it's bitten me so often that I really, like, really want to automate this now. So it's automated now. Uh, so actually, uh, I switched from Travis to CircleCI, and at that point in time, like, okay, let's do it properly now. Um, uh, so in CircleCI, it runs all the tests for all the examples and tries to build it, compile it, and actually, it's all, all of the examples are also automatically deployed to now, and uh, so you can test it there as well. Um, and all of this lives in a mono repo. So React Async is just one repository on, uh, on GitHub, uh, which contains the examples, but it also contains actually, t at this point in time, two packages, React Async itself and React Async DevTools, which is uh, a side package uh, that I built for it. Uh, but that also means that you need a bunch of tooling around those monorepos. And you might be like, ah, oh, yeah, Yarn has workspaces, so we'll be good. Uh, no. You're not there yet. Then you might have heard of Lerna. Lerna, uh, Lerna does everything around uh, monorepos, right? Uh, no, it sucks in certain areas. Um, and so actually, this is the workflow that we have for React Async. So first of all, obviously, Yarn. we use Yarn. Yarn workspaces are great. Yarn is much better than NPM. So Yarn handles all the dependencies when you install like you do yarn install or just yarn in the root of the repository, it will install all of the dependencies of the root, but also from all the sub packages and all the places, all the workspaces, uh, and do that in, in, handle that in a proper way. Then there is a thing called relative depths. And relative depths is not very well known. It's actually built by Michel Westrate, who also built Mobex. Um, and it's uh, actually kind of a replacement for Simlinks. So you might have known Yarn Link or NPM Link, which creates Simlinks so that it can actually, like, I have the library, the library that, I'm, that I'm developing, and I have an example that depends on that. But when I update my code, I want this example to also use this newly updated code, right? I don't want that to stick to something that's on NPM. No, I want that po to point to my local machine. Uh, so you can use Simlinking for that, but then you're actually linking against the sources of your package and not what's actually going to be published on NPM. 
And that's also bitten me in the past a couple of times. So what actually Relative Depths does is it actually builds your library as if you're just about to publish it to NPM, and then basically copies the files on your file system from, that, from this place where it's built into the places where it's going to be used, and that's, that's how it does it. So it actually copies this just into the node modules directory of the each of the examples. So it's, it's basically as if it was installed from NPM, uh, but it's actually just, it, it's just a file watcher that does that all the time. Or, um, actually, that's the way you could configure it. And then Lerna runs all the tests and the build scripts in all the packages, so the, the, the library itself, but also the examples. It bumps the version number, so that's what I also use Lerna for, to bump a uh, version number uh, in all of the packages. So they are actually all equal, so when I go React Async is now version 9.0.0, uh, all the examples are also version 9.0.0. Uh, and then there's pcap pack, which I mentioned briefly before, which handles the actually building and packing of the, the, the artifact that is going to be published on NPM. Uh, pack is great because it, like it, it automatically ships types, the TypeScript definitions for it. It automatically uh, makes sure that you ship the modern ES7 code or ES 2019 code, I guess, beside the uh, ES5 uh, code. Um, and then finally, I use NPM to actually publish a package. Mistake number three, neglecting the types, as in the type system. Um, like it or not, but types are here to stay. So I actually am a JavaScript developer and not a TypeScript developer. Uh, I have not written much TypeScript so far. <laughs> Uh, even for React Async. Um, so, um, but I had to face rea reality. So when I built React Async, I built it in just JavaScript, uh, modern syntax all over. Uh, but I had to face the reality that people wanted to use React Async in their TypeScript project. And that means that they want a good user experience like the developer experience that they are used to, and that means that I'm going to have to ship type definitions for React Async. So the way to do that is you just you can just tack it on to your project, your JavaScript uh, project, using an, a, a .d, like a .ts file. So it's a definition file, type definition file, um, and a lot of people use that. So that's the, the type definition file that I ship with React Async, and then there is also some people, it's getting less and less, who still care about the prop types. I personally don't give a about the prop types. Uh, but still, um, they are both in the library, and like, keeping them in sync with the actual source code, it's just a pain in the ass. It's, a lot of, it, it's not necessarily a lot of work, but it's work, right? So essentially, the way I handle it right now is if you open a pull request, I have a template, a pull request template that has just a, a checklist, like did you update the, ty the type definitions for TypeScript? Did you update the prop types? And you have to check them all. And that's the process that we have right now. So it's just annoying. So let's be honest, this is a wise thing to do. So this is actually currently in progress. We're migrating to TypeScript. Uh, and luckily, so far, I still have not written any TypeScript because I'm not doing it. Uh, <laughs> so there's these two guys from, Be from Germany. Uh, and they were like, yeah, we had some slack time at our company, and we were like, yeah, we, you, we use this, and we, we love React Async, but we would like to see this being in TypeScript. I'm like, go for it. Do it, please. Open a pull request. So this has been obviously ongoing because it's quite a big project. Like, look at the, the changes and additions, whatever. Um, they're basically, they're rewriting the entire thing in TypeScript. But yeah, I'm turning it on. So actually, version 10, I plan that to be the TypeScript release. Um, uh, and hopefully, I, I, they, they just told me this morning that tomorrow they have another Slack time day uh, at their company, so they're going to be working on it again. Uh, so maybe I'll help them out, and maybe next week, I don't know, we'll, we'll have something that we can actually release. Would be cool. Um, so yeah, it's... It's 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 it, it's I'm I've, I'm giving it out of my hands and I really really love that because um, but that's uh, another subject. Um, mistake number four, not writing about it. 
when you have an open source project and you it's, it's your baby, right? And you want it to grow and be popular and succeed and allow me to be on conferences, on stage and everything. Uh, it's kind of doing that, but not enough yet. Uh, popularity, it's, it, it's, it, it comes not by having a great library in itself. Like your code can be flawless and perfect and super nice and uh, solve a lot of problems, but if people don't hear about it, they will not know about it and will not start using it. So one of the things that I have been doing is speaking at meetups and conferences, but yeah, I only, well, this is quite a big meetup, so now I reach quite a few people, um, but yeah, that's not the big bang that, you, that you're looking for. So actually, so what, what actually happened in August 2018, when I kind of released the first version of React Async, I wrote a blog post. Uh, data loading with React Async. It's now more of a general thing. Like at first it was mostly about doing HTTP requests and such. And uh, now it's anything with promises. Uh, uh, but this was in August 2018. And then... <laughs> mm -hmm. So October 2019, I wrote another blog post saying, yeah, React Async version now is now released. Awesome, and 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 I was really like kicking myself, like why didn't I just write a blog post with every major release, at least every major release, right? Uh, uh, and then uh, so, so that you can actually build some traction. Like the only thing I was just doing is shouting on Twitter, like yeah, version seven is now released, and and yeah, I have. Uh, I, I guess I, I don't know a thousand followers or something, so it's okayish. And uh, can see Dodds is actually promoting React Async in, because he's using it in his workshops. Uh, so that's great. So actually, I just tweet and I say, at Kansi Dots, and he retweets, and then I have a lot of fun. But <laughs> <laughs> I get a, it gets some traction. So you, know, you have to, I guess, know the right people. So, But still, like writing blog posts, that's one thing I learned from the storybook community, actually. So uh, I, 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 I got kind of involved now with the storybook uh, thing, now, now that I work for Chroma. And I'm taking a lot of learnings from, from how uh, Norbert and the rest of the team has handled Storybook, because Storybook was almost dead like uh, two years ago or something. And now it's like the biggest project on, uh, on GitHub. Like I, I, I think the third, the third biggest one. But anyway, it's, it's huge and it's great. Uh, but uh, I learned a lot of things from that. Like not, it's not, uh, they're, they're <laughs> top 100, top 100 uh, whatever. It's it's huge. It's great. It's it's top three. <laughs> now I actually, actually uh, it's I, I think it's top. It's number three on the list of TypeScript projects. What? Yeah, I, th I looked it up recently. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's uh, anyway. I, I get a lot of ideas from that um, because like Norbert handles this this project in a way like it's not my project. I just help people get started with it and help them contribute to it. So that's actually. Mistake number five. I've been going at this for way too long just on my own, <laughs> right? I started this project uh, over a year ago, and it's been my project and only my project for a year. Uh, and going at it alone, it doesn't scale. Like, if I want to take a break, or I don't know, uh, I'm gonna have a, we're going to have a, another baby uh, next month, uh, or actually in December, uh, so it's, that's going to be like a time when I definitely probably not going to have time for React Async. Uh, it would be nice if other people would actually be uh, be, be continuing uh, working on it. So going at it alone is not a great way. So this is actually what it looks like right now. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, th th that doesn't work. So I'm really, really... Want I want this to be a community product. So that's over the summer, uh, I was like, okay, I'm just going to stop working on the code itself. I'm going to start working on the project instead. So I uh, moved it from my personal GitHub account to an organization on GitHub. I, open, I created the, uh, the documentation website uh, with, a, uh, with a domain name and all that stuff, and Twitter account, Discord channel, and a whole bunch of stuff that you need when you want a, it to be a community project rather than just your personal project. Uh, I actually have funding for it now even. Uh, Coming back, by the way, to this thing over here, it's actually a bit, uh, it's not true completely, because I have been using Squash and Merge on the project, 
which essentially means that all the commits become one commit. So actually, this, this guy, this Fernias on, on the left, he has two commits. That's actually two pull requests. Because there's one commit per pull request when it actually reaches master. And that's actually the master branch, I think. So that has to be released as well. So it's not really true, because I can commit directly to the branch, and they, all the others have to go through the pull request. So it's not really uh, an honest picture. So actually, I'm, as you can see in this picture, I just today changed that to create a merge commit. Let's go back to the basics. So that everyone will have like a fair amount of commits on the, ma on the master branch in the history, right? Uh, because this is <laughs> just a bit unfair. Uh, which actually, because I've been preferring squash and merge for like a, a couple of years, and just today I'm like, I'm now convinced that like squash and merge, sure, it, makes you, it gives you a nice Git history, but it's way more, way more important to give other people recognition for their work and having them in the statistics and not lying about the history of the project, right? So one thing I did, it's uh, I'm creating a bigger bigger project out of this. Uh, it's called async library, uh, named after React testing library, you might know it, or testing library by Kenzie Dodds. Um, and the async library is, a, is, a, is aimed to be bigger than just React async. Actually, just yesterday, I created Svelte async, just saying, so you should be using Svelte, no, just kidding, uh, as a prototype, uh, because a former colleague, he was like, yeah, I want to do a Svelte version of this, and another one, yeah, I want to view a view version of this, uh, go for it, uh, but obviously, uh, I want to promote that and enable that, so the role that I'm taking in this is enabling that. I want people to start building an Angular version and a review version and a, uh, whatever version uh, and having integrations with MobX, Redux, and all those uh, other things that you can pro possibly think of, Gatsby, GraphQL, whatever. Um, but it should have a central place. So that's async library. Um, and it's looking for contributors. So if you're interested in doing open source and any kind of contribution is welcome, please uh, join us, that would be really awesome. So, in conclusion, lessons learned. Um, carefully consider the version numbering uh, and, and use release candidates where, where, where it's appropriate. Uh, and then test for compatibility also against external libraries, not just your own code, but test for other, like the, how it communicates with other libraries. I learned that TypeScript is actually quite a natural choice for libraries because you're going to have to maintain a type definition anyway, so you might just as well write it in TypeScript, uh, even though I'm not a TypeScript fan. Um, you have to write probably more content, so blog posts, articles, whatever, documentation, than you actually write code. So if you're not into marketing, maybe open source not your... No, you can always contribute to open source. Uh, but someone's going to have to do still the marketing, which is like, I don't like it either. I'm not... Kitsy with his awesome followers, uh, or I don't know, whatever. Um, but so, uh, someone's still, still going to have to be on a stage and promote this stuff and if you want it to be successful. And then finally, create a community and share the ownership. I don't want to take ownership over this. Actually, I just, when I was sitting in the audience just now, I was like, maybe we should just go back to version 1.0 when I'm going to release it under the at async library namespace on NPM. We can just call it 1.0. Uh, actually, I might be, I'm, I'm actually considering that. And then it's not my project, but it's actually the community's project. Uh, so maybe that's a good idea. So uh, thanks for listening. This is me. Uh, you can fo follow me uh, over there. And uh, obviously, uh, yeah, go check out React Async.